I'm going to tell you a story. That perked your ears up a little bit now, didn't it? I doubt whether you'd have had the same reaction if I'd said, I'm going to give you a lecture. <laughs> Think back to your freshman English class or your FYW seminar. <laughs> You've been asked to write an essay about something. Maybe you care about it, and maybe you don't. In either case, first of all, you've got to come up with a thesis, a relevant idea that you think or that you hope your professor thinks <laughs> is worthy of defending. Then you find some particulars you can cite as evidence, and you figure out how you can link them to your idea and what sequence you're going to put them in. Idea, details, connections. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's not how stories usually work. Although it's possible to craft a story to illustrate an idea, stories usually approach things from the opposite direction. Whether you're writing them or reading them, stories start with particulars of place, time, characters and events. We live with those particulars, immerse ourselves in the world of the story, until we get to that happy point when it seems that we're no longer even aware of the individual words and sentences on the page. They seem to be a window through which we see that world, or better yet, a door through which we enter it ourselves. That's what getting lost in a book means. Stories usually don't begin with an idea, but they suggest ideas. Not the unitary idea of a thesis in a formal essay, but many ideas that manifest themselves differently to different persons at different times in different cultural and emotional places. Think of a story as a stone dropped into the pool of each reader's mind, creating concentric ripples, some of which are noted consciously, and some of which resonate on a level that might be difficult or even impossible to articulate. If a story is really working, then it finds you, wherever you happen to be at a particular moment, and it speaks to you about something you know is important. This flexibility, this ability to become a living part of the reader's own experience, makes stories tremendously attractive to me. That's why I'm primarily a writer rather than a scholar. I write poetry as well as prose fiction, and the process works a little differently in poetry, but it still involves that marvelous possibility of creating a text that can speak in the emotional and intellectual language of the person beholding it. Because poems tend to be shorter than prose fiction, and because I only have 18 minutes, I'm going to be using some short narrative poems as examples a little, a little later on. But for now, let's think about a story that you're all familiar with, the story of Cinderella. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Impoverished, mistreated young woman whose physical and spiritual beauty is for the, for the moment hidden, learns that her world's most eligible bachelor, the prince, will be hosting a matchmaking party in the near future. Her evil stepsisters, aided and abetted by her evil stepmother, will attend, but Cinderella will not. Then the fairy godmother mother appears, a beneficent spirit with some magic and with some considerable street cred. A pumpkin turns into a carriage, some rats turn into horses, 
Cinderella gets a dress to die for. She attends the party, and she captures the prince's heart. But even magic has its limits. And in this case, the limit is midnight. Cinderella has to hot foot it out of there before the spell breaks. And in her haste, she leaves one of her glass slippers behind. Now the prince has some detective work to do. He travels throughout the kingdom, looking for the woman whose foot perfectly fits the shoe. The stepsisters give it their best shot. In some accounts, cutting off toes or heel in the process. But the prince finds Cinderella, the shoe fits her virtuous foot, and the couple live happily ever after. Most folks encounter this story at an early age. I knew its basic outlines before I entered kindergarten. And they identify with the young person who overcomes mistreatment and misunderstanding to achieve her rightful place in the world. You can't keep a good kid down. But for an older person encountering or re-encountering the story, things might work a little differently. Let's say you're a divorced mother who's recently remarried to a man who also has a child to create what's called these days a blended family. Let's also say you're having difficulty finding affectionate space in your heart for that new child. You might uneasily identify with the stepmother in the Cinderella story and wonder if you can do an extreme makeover to turn yourself into the fairy godmother. Or let's suppose your younger sister whom you've teased mercilessly for the past 16 years, has burst from the chrysalis of adolescence to catch the eye of your boyfriend. Now who's the character who's caught your own eye? Or let's suppose that you're a young man who's become very, very tired of having his parents and friends try to set him up with blind dates. Well, it's the same story, but it's not the same story. Perhaps a dozen years ago, I found myself reconsidering Cinderella from yet another angle. I found myself wondering what in the world the fairy godmother does when she isn't flying around helping other people. And if helping other people is all that she does, would we enlightened souls in the early 21st century consider her a positive role model? If she were our friend, might we not advise her to seek professional help, or at least Dr. Phil? So I wrote a short poem that playfully addresses those questions. <laughs> the fairy godmother in therapy. She was told to think more about herself, to look out for numera una, to improve her self-concept so she wouldn't have that unruly urge to help other Ellis. You're an enabler. <laughs> Don't the horses and the carriage go back to what they always were and always will be? She wasn't convinced. But her breakthrough came when she saw through the glass slipper. If it's one of yours, whose foot should it fit? 
When she left the office that morning, the last words in her beautiful ears were, don't thank me, you have good insurance. <laughs> After the rats ran away to the lab for their own safety, and the pumpkin pies cooled on the windowsill, the prince came to love her cooking. Now she saves all of Cinderella's letters, unopened, and uses a hole puncher to string those smudged irrelevancies into a rosary around her frigid air, counting them every morning, chanting, I am not responsible. I am not responsible. I am not responsible. Here's another, more recent poem in which I return to the Cinderella story. I'm recalling the aftermath of my mother's death in December 1978. Although mom was born in southern Oklahoma, her family moved to the Pennsylvania mountains to work in the coal mines. She had eight brothers and two sisters, and although she was in the middle of the pack, she was the first one to pass away. Uncles, December 1978. The day before mom's funeral, like bats, they fluttered in at sunset. Joseph, Tom, Steve, Oscar, Henry, Eddie, John, and Bart. Hungover and determined, they'd all come from central Pennsylvania in two cars. They trudged into my father's house. Little men, stooped from mining anthracite, eight dwarfs in search of their first ending, single file. So long they told the story of 11 brothers and sisters my father served them shots and beers past midnight when, praise be to heaven, they all staggered out. Their unlit cigarettes, their wrinkled faces, broken umbrellas, stained with rain for their lost Cinderella. It was, of course, uh, a very difficult time for my father and me. But we still saw something comical as well as touching in the scene. I'm working with two fairy tales in the poem, Snow White and not just Cinderella. But uh, after you've been matching drinks with retired coal miners for a while, sometimes things can get mixed up. And sometimes you don't even have to be drinking. Think of Superman, the man of steel. There he is. <laughs> Powerful as Hercules, but with kryptonite as his Achilles heel. Or strong as Samson, with kryptonite his Delilah. A helpless infant, come down from the heavens, entrusted to the tender care of a foster family out in the middle of nowhere. The kid grows up, and he goes to Metropolis to live a double life as a mild-mannered reporter giving the good news to the Daily Planet, and as a hero with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men who fights for truth, justice, and the American way. Yes, stories are flexible and versatile and instructive and consoling. And let's not forget, a whole lot of fun. But they're not life, although they always touch upon life, and sometimes they touch upon it so deeply that we strive to change the way we live. 
I'll finish with a poem entitled The Story, which recalls something that happened to me a long time ago when I was about the same age as many of you folks in the audience. At the moment, the poem speaks to me about the power and the danger of stories, about what it means to live as what the poet Wallace Stevens called a man made out of words. But you might find something else here, and you'd probably be right. The story for Jim McConkey, who had to read it. I was 19, maybe 20, walking across Triphammer Bridge, new manuscript in hand, when I tripped, and a sudden gust carried the caracible bond between the guardrails into the open air. I got up just in time to watch those pages flutter a hundred feet to decorate Fall Creek. No other copy and no staircase down. What would Ernest Hemingway do now? I asked myself. Once on the other side, my sneakers backed me down from stone to slippery stone, mo moist autumn shale, shellacked with leaves, through a semi-vertical scrub forest until I saw that metal bridge, now from the bottom of the gorge. Amazingly, the pages lay like giant handkerchiefs scattered on either bank, six on a side, none in the room shed by the waterfall. All legible. I put them back in order, then looked up for the way. I couldn't find the almost path I'd taken, so I chose the easiest from where I stood. Halfway, it turned into something harder, almost sheer, next to impossible. I thought of turning around, looked back with just my eyes, and felt my feet give way. Then I saw everything, two things, a solid sapling on my left and a spindlier one off to my right with half its roots exposed above the rocks. But those pages were cradled in my left arm. I didn't think, I didn't hesitate, I grabbed that naked, unsuspecting twig with only my right hand. By God, it held, and so did I. Rebalanced on a ledge, hands shaking with what could have been the cold, I slid those pages underneath my shirt next to my undershirt to keep them safer. These days, of course, it never could have happened. We back up everything. That story would have been safely on a hard drive, CD-ROM, the manuscript disposable confetti. I'd have cursed, then laughed, and then consoled myself. At least papers biodegradable. <laughs> Yet 40 years later, it amazes me that I could have thought, no, felt, within my deepest being, that those words, my words, were worth my present and my future life. The story? I can't recall even its title, try as I might, or a single character. It was 12 pages, pitifully unique, I probably destroyed in shame or grief 
a few years later. At best, I toss them out with reams of others when I move to where I'm living now, a mountain where words matter, but not so much. Thanks for listening and enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>